and I'm going to start brushing. Hi everyone, thank you for joining us. I'm just gonna allow it a minute so people can start joining us. Hello and welcome to today's public program, the first collaborative event between Griffin Art Projects and the Polygon Gallery. Curator's conversation, perspective on the work on Stan Douglas. Thank you so much for joining us here today. My name is Fauni Barra and I'm the Public Programs and Residency Coordinator at Griffin Art Projects. Joining me today to introduce the Polygon and help coordinate the Q&A, we have the Polygon's Gallery TD Curatorial Fellow, Sayo Oluo Wake. Before we begin, we would like to acknowledge that our place, our work takes place on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, and Stolo nations, to whom we are deeply grateful. As well, we're joined by Dr. Shell Sim and Dr. Karen Tang from Jojage, Montreal, a site of meeting and exchange for many First Nations, including the Ganyangi Haga, Huron Wanda, Abenaki, and Anishinaabeg peoples. We would like to thank Canadian Heritage and Northern Cuba Recreation and Culture for the support of today's event. A few housekeeping notes before today's presentation. If you would like to see the live captions displayed, you can enable this by selecting the CC live transmission button at the bottom of your screen. If you're experiencing any technical issues with the Zoom interface, we will also be able, uh, we will also be live streaming today's event on Griffin Art Project's Facebook page, so you can watch from there as well. Uh, Shad to just paste um, the Facebook page and the chat for everyone to see. And lastly, I'll mention that at the end of today's presentation, there will be a chance for a Q&A. So if at any point uh, during the presentation you have questions, you can uh, just ask uh, in the Q&A chat box and we will read it from there. To begin today's talk, as far as written uh, spotlight features, where we invite local BIPOC organizations to give a short presentation on the work that they do, we have the honor of hosting the Black Art Center. Black is a Black youth owned and operated gallery and community site based in Surrey, BC, that is dedicated to supporting multidisciplinary art created by Black youth. To present the organization's mission and vision, we have Morati. Morati, please join us here. Hi, um, thank you all so much for um, being here and thank you for that introduction. Um, my name is Maruti George. I am the programming and curatorial lead at um, the Black Art Center. And I am also a curator and um, MA candidate and educator here at the School for Contemporary Arts, which is on Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh territories and also in the heart of the downtown east side, which is going through a lot um, right now. Um, so Black is um, a, an artist run center um, in the heart of Surrey. Um, Black is located right under Surrey Central Skytrain Station. And we believe that our location would um, essentially um, change the idea that people have regarding Surrey. And one of our plans is for Black to be an encounter. We want people to encounter the Black space, but we also want people to journey to the Black space and um, shift their ideas um, and um, presuppositions with, reg with regards to the Surrey area. Um, like um, was said before, um, Black is is already we just got our space a couple months ago it is a youth run artist run center and community space in surrey um, we believe that the youth run aspect is extremely important because ever so often um, organizations and institutions say that they want to cater to 
young BIPOC people, but they don't really um, go out of their way to hire um, young BIPOC people and give them mentorship and training that they would need to succeed in whatever position they get at these institutions. Um, we think that the youth run aspect of our institution kind of allows us to take into account different, different perspectives, um, our perspectives as youths, as well as the perspectives that we have gotten from the amazing older BIPOC people who have mentored us and um, created our practice and um, helped us shape our mandates. So Black um, Black's mandate is essentially to create a space where Black creativity um, and community can thrive. Um, a lot of the people that work at Black, including me, think a lot about futurity. We don't want our space to be a space that exists just for now. We want it to be a space that becomes a monument in the lower mainland and also in BC as a whole. Um, a monument to Blackness and a monument to community. Um, another important aspect of Black is mentorship. Um, we um, as a young person and as a, an educator, um, I understand that a lot of the opportunities that I have gotten were due to the people who have mentored me and have taught me how to go about things with, um, to do things that I wouldn't have learned in art school. So um, as in my role as the curatorial lead, part of what I do is go into the schools in the Surrey district and talk to young Black folks as well as the other BIPOC people in Surrey and tell them about the opportunities that exist in the art world and also tell them about opportunities that um, exist outside of the arts, including with the sciences and collaborations for and means for collaborations with organizations in Vancouver. So mentorship is a huge aspect of Black as well as um, community development and um, non-traditional institutional, a non-traditional institutional mandate. Um, this non-traditional institutional mandate is also um, part of how we run Black in terms of an artist-run center. Even though we're an artist-run center and a gallery space, we understand that I especially understand as is someone who works in a gallery right now, a traditional gallery right now, um, the the way that gallery spaces kind of um, do not invite people in sometimes. We want to call Black a community space to, in an effort to subvert the ideas that exist with regards to gallery spaces and artist-run centers. Um, part of how we do this and we plan to continue doing this in the future is by hosting screenings as well as workshops that aren't directly related to arts. Um, we plan on having a black hair braiding workshop in the black space, which is something that kind of speaks to um, the idea of a community space as opposed to solely being dedicated to as solely being an artist run center. That is a huge part of our mandate. Um, one of the most important aspects of Black as an artist run center and community development space is the idea of um, open practices. Um, Black runs on a programming submission model right now. And um, even though I am the curator there, I understand that as I have a formal art school background and I am still in art school right now, um, this doesn't give me um, it's a privilege and it also doesn't really help me understand that art practices can exist without art school training sometimes. So we have a submission based model where we kind of curate the shows and workshops that would happen in the black space um, based on the submissions that we get in order to facilitate more engagement with the black community, especially the younger black community who might not have art school training um, right now, but also to kind of um, shift up the idea of the Carfac artist payment model. Um, how do we judge people and how do we, um, who is an artist and who is not an artist according to Carfac? And that's something that we would continue to do and in different in different ways in the black space. Um, the last part of our mandate and vision is kind of this idea of networking and opportunity. Um, this 
Um, this manifested in one of the projects that we have done as Black in the Black Artist Directory, which was open last year, but can also still, um, if people need the directory, they can contact us as Black. So um, what we did was get the names and the emails and um, the a tiny portfolio of all of a lot of Black artists in um, BC and um, the Lower Mainland. Um, and this kind of helped us to have a solid space, a solid um, archive, some would say, of the um, archive and database of the Black artists that exist in Vancouver, what their practice is, and the work that they have done. Um, this database kind of acts as um, a, um, I don't know the right word to use, but in the sense that when people are like, oh, we didn't have enough Black artists for this exhibition because we didn't know that there were Black artists in Vancouver, like that um, stands in opposition to that because there, there are so many artists who replied and um, put their information in this database. So you, the institution or whatever could have is essentially contacted Black to get in contact with this art, these artists. Um, we have also used these database to give um, Black artists um, to inform them of opportunities. The most recent one um, is a mural project that the Black team is um, is facilitating in collaboration with the PCI development group. And the PCI group is um, a development group that has a lot of new developments in Surrey. And what they want to do now is to kind of um, is to talk about Surrey's history and the amount of um, Black people in Surrey um, by commissioning murals that would go in their new development space. And essentially what Black did was um, we created a contract with PCI and we also talked about fees for payment and um, for the artists and facilitated all of the artists' needs as well as our own and then sent out this um, proposal and opportunity to the members of our directory. And this is, um, to me, is a very good practice because I find that sometimes a lot of artists don't really know what they can get from opportunities and having like the black team kind of fight for you when you don't really know that there are people fighting for you necessarily um, um, is a good thing. So that is a way that we um, create networks and opportunities in um, a digital, um, database but we also do that in um in with regards to our workshops and like these um events that we offer at the space um our most recent um project at the black space was an exhibition called concealed cultures um and um i see i breathe i am that took place in the Surrey Art Gallery. I'm just trying to share my screen now. Sorry. Here. Um, why is that the wrong thing? Here. So yeah, this exhibition was essentially um, an opportunity that was given to us. Um, the Black team was invited to curate a show um, at the Surrey Art Gallery because um, we do have a small space and because of all of like a lot of logistical conundrums with grants and applications, um, we might not, we do not have the capacity to have a show of this scale just yet, but I um, in the future, hopefully. So these two exhibitions spoke on themes of community as well as um, concealment and the nuances of existing as a black body in um, from the diaspora. And um, they in this exhibition, we featured artworks that an artist who um, live in the Vancouver area. And it was also a very good opportunity for um, black to kind of, um, I curated the show and developed the um, pedagogy as well as the, all of the logistical stuff but the other members of the black team helped a lot with communications and they helped plan the programming and events for the show so it was um, a good project to help us um, 
cement our identity in Vancouver and also like help us understand the things that we can do if we had the chance, as well as um, give opportunity for people in the city to kind of see artworks and art practices that they might not see in um, a traditional gallery per se. So uh, my screen sharing is paused. Is this not... No. Um... But yeah, I just I'm going to show some of the images from the exhibition, which is not working. <laughs> so um, yeah, that's kind of all I have to say. Thank you all for listening to me. And um, I guess I would wait for questions at the end. Yes. If you have any questions um, for Marathi, you can also ask. Uh, use the Q and A panel to uh, ask them. Uh, Morati, do you want me to share your email so that folks can be in touch with you? Yes, yes, you can share. I'll right. share it for everyone now. And thank what? you so much for your. I'll share it with everyone now. Okay. Um, yes, and you can follow uh, the Black Art Center on their Instagram at the Black Art Center. Uh, so to begin our panel today, I would like to introduce uh, Griffin Arts Project, and. Um, is director Lisa Baldessera. So Griffin Art Projects is a non-profit art residency and gallery located in North Vancouver, devoted to supporting artists in the production of new work through its residency program and in creating new research on contemporary Canadian and international art artists and art collections from around the world in its exhibition program. Griffin is a non-collecting institution that has quickly become a vibrant contributor to the North Vancouver cultural landscape and visual art practices in the region through its exhibitions, residency, and public programs. Griffin Art Projects exhibitions and events are always free and open to all to attend. Lisa Valdezera has worked in curatorial roles in public art galleries in Western Canada since 1999, including senior curator at Contemporary Gallery from 2014 to 2016, and chief curator at the Mandel Art Gallery in Saskatoon from 2012 to 2014, she was curator of contemporary art at the Art Gallery of Greater Victoria from 1999 to 2009, where she produced more than 50 exhibitions of local, Canadian, and international artists. She holds MFAs in creative writing from UBC and art from the University of Saskatchewan and a PhD from Goldsmiths College. Valdisera has served on contemporary art juries across Canada and internationally, including the Canada Council for the Arts, Royal Bank of Canada, Canadian Painting Competition, the Soviet Art Award, and a guest of the British Arts Council Outreach Program. She's the director of Griffin Art Projects. I'm going to let Sayo uh, introduce the Polygon and its director, Rich Shire. Situated on the unceded territories of the Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, and Musqueam nations, the Polygon Gallery is a vibrant art institution that inspires and provokes cultural insight through adventurous programming and is committed to championing artists and cultivating engaged audiences. Its expansive programming features acclaimed Vancouver photographers, world-renowned as well as emerging artists, and innovative exhibitions of historic and vernacular photography and is committed to the development of lens-based practices and to creating pathways for new voices within the medium, particularly as it works to articulate new narratives from artists, tra um, artists traditionally outside the Eurocentric perspective of many art galleries. Which brings me to Richaya. Richaya is the director of the Polygon Gallery, former, um, formerly Presentation House Gallery in North Vancouver. Since joining the Polygon in 2006, which has spearheaded the development of a $17.5 million waterfront facility, which opened in 2017. Prior to this, Shire was chief curator of the Power Plant Contemporary Art Gallery in Toronto from 2004 to 2006, curator of the Contemporary Art Gallery in Vancouver from 2002 to 2004, and director and curator of the Artist Run Or Gallery in Vancouver from 1996 to 2001. Shire has curated more than 80 exhibitions and, is, and his critical writing has been published broadly, including a recent essay on Stan Douglas's public artwork, Abbott and Cordova, 7th of August, 1971. Shire curated the Stan Douglas exhibition, 2011 does not equal 1848, 
for the Canada Pavilion during the 59th edition of the Venice Biennale, which is featuring now at the Polygon. And I'll hand back over to Fonny. Thank you so much. So joining us from Montreal, we have Dr. Cheryl Sim and Dr. Karen Tam. Cheryl Sim is Managing Director and Curator at the Pi Foundation for Contemporary Arts, as well as an artist and scholar. Her work ethos has been greatly informed by artists run center culture. Recent exhibitions include Relations, Diaspora and Painting on 2020 and Stand Douglas Revealing Narratives in 2022, which boasts gamer critical acclaim. Her video and installation work has been presented in exhibitions and festivals in North America and Europe. She has a PhD in the Etude et Pratique des Arts program at the University of Quebec in Montreal. And her book, Pouring the Chill Sandras and Culture in a Chinese Diaspora, was published by Bloomsbury Academic in uh, 2019. We also have Dr. Karen Tam. Uh, Dr. Karen Tam is a Joe Jackie Montreal based artist whose research focuses on the constructions and imaginations of ethnic spaces through installations in which she creates Chinese restaurants, karaoke lounges, opium dens, curry shops, and other uh, sites of cultural encounters. She has exhibited her work and participated in residencies in North America, Europe, and China, including the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts and the He, he Chang Ng Art Museum. She holds a PhD in cultural studies from the Goldsmiths University of London and an MFA in sculpture from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. She is represented by Gallery of Charbonneau. Uh, I'll pass the mic to Karen now. Great, thank you, Fanny. So um, thank you everyone for joining us today. And um, I'm going to just be facilitating um, the conversation between Reed, Cheryl, and Lisa, who will be um, talking about their experiences in curating Stan Douglas's exhibitions um, you know, at the Griffin, um, currently on show and at the Polygon and the Venice Biennial. Um, and then Cheryl will also talk about um, the show at the Phi Foundation earlier this year. So um, how we're gonna proceed um, is that uh, Reed, um, Lisa and Cheryl will talk about you know five minutes or so about um, their exhibition projects, and then I'll ask them a few questions. And then afterwards, um, there'll be an opportunity for the panelists to ask questions of another. And then finally, we'll open it up for the audience Q&A. So I'm going to ask Lisa to start us off. Thank you so much, Karen. And thank you, Marachi, as well, for introducing um, your um, space. Um, such an interesting kind of outline and hub space. So thank you so much for the work you're doing there. Um, so I just thought I would really briefly, we're gonna have the images of the show kind of run as I talk a little bit about um, the experience of curating uh, this exhibition. Um, I was really thrilled to be asked by Henning and Brigitte Freiby, uh, who are collectors and supporters of um, Stan Douglas's work uh, to consider a project on Stan on the occasion of the Venice Biennale project. Um, and as a result of that, um, we really, um, we have a small space at Griffin, 3,000 square feet, and um, although um, uh, the major films, of course, are, are incredible works, um, we decided that we would focus on photography and photography from several series. So it's a bit of a, what we're calling a micro retrospective of photography from 1988 to 2014. Um, and it's including private collections and public collections. So we have generous loans from the Vancouver Art Gallery and the Odean um, Art Gallery as well. Um, and so in order to look through this and try and create something concise and to think about Stan's work in a way that would make sense with this compression, um, I decided to focus on site, architecture and urban fabric and really particularly looking at storytelling and the querying of history through sort of specific instance that he's so, um, uh, his archival and research um, um, history really makes so clear in his work. So right now you're looking at um, subject to a film, Marnie, which is based on um, the Alfred Hitchcock film from 1964. And this is sort of one of the classic, um, the, the apparatuses that, that uh, he uses um, which I think are sort of recur throughout all of his work, um, looking both at how 
uh, memory functions, how history and storytelling function, how archives are sorted and who, who um, decides the archives that will be hidden and those that will be not recorded at all and how that kind of focus on apparatus meets the sort of technical disciplinary apparatuses of film, photography, and theater in their, in their capacities. Um, so you're seeing the script uh, for this subject to a film, which is really a shooting script that ends up being a kind of circular um, narrative where we end where we began, um, focused on one character in the, in the film. Um, the photographs um, are equal to the film works in the sense that they are, although they arise out of them, they are also spatializing these kinds of concerns differently than the films do. Um, so you'll see here Hogan's Alley on the left, and we have a um, uh, the iPad in the space, which is featuring the 19, uh, circa 1948 app. And this um, project, Hogan's Alley, actually comes out of, um, as many of you already know, comes out of the um, of the uh, Helen Lawrence Theater Project, um, and is a, a kind of accretion of many of the images in the archival documents that. Um, he was able to uh, source in the making of that project, um, the theater project. This is just a view of the, the space itself. And you can see um, there's an image of the Maritime Workers Hall, as well as three images um, from one place or show, the set images from one place or show. And so it really shows a kind of mise en abeam, this kind of set site within a site um, that really shows the hand of the, of this kind of you know, ruptures the seamlessness of the filmmaking and also the making of photo documents. And as we know, photography since the 19th century has had this great weightiness in terms of its, um, the sense of it being a, a site of truth telling and veracity. And so Douglas in combining um, what you see on the left when place or show and something like um, what you see on the right, which is the um, old curio shop, which is an actual photograph of, um, of, a, of a shop in White Rock um, that um, existed for I think 70 years and, uh, and it's just a document, um, but it shows this kind of accretion in a di very different way. So in this exhibition, it was really looking at um, how his work um, is a kind of coring archeological kind of dig into both a site and an archive. Um, you can see sort of on the, on the far right there, Ballantine Pier, um, which is a kind of classic work uh, looking at the, um, the great battle, the Ballantine Pier battle um, from 1935. And then to the right of that, uh, we can see um, Las Terrazas number 10, which shows the, um, a photograph of the, um, the site of the workers' uh, um, apartments. And uh, it, this was a repurposing the workers of the, the land that the farmers no longer had work. And so the landscape was repurposed and and turned into a new um, agro-tourism industry and the farmers were hired and housed there uh, because the coffee plantations had completely gutted the industry around that area. So there's a real kind of vectoring through the works in the show and also through Douglas's work that shows um, this kind of concern with labor, with visibility, um, with the racialization as well of certain sites um, through occlusion. So on the, on the right here, sorry, on the left-hand side, you'll see an image called Walhachen, which is from the Klatsassen series. And then there, there are four small images um, and also an additional kind of um, overview of a shooting script of the um, Ruskin series that was done in the early 90s in which um, features almost a Burnt and Hilla Becker style um, documentation of a 1925 dam that was built at that time in the town of Ruskin, which is named for John Ruskin. And it was a small utopian town um, that was uh, constructed with you know, all kinds of aspirations for communal living. And then uh, this um, series of images focuses on uh, the story of a missing Japanese worker and that this, the town of Ruskin was settled by many Japanese laborers before the war and of course uh, post-war after the removal of Japanese workers became a kind of ghost town as is Walhachen which is on the left. Um, so those kinds of um, elements um, are, are really recurring ones um, within, the, within the concerns that, that Douglas um, uh, from my view has 
has really focused on for, for much of his work. Um, and, and in looking at the architectural kind of residue or the geographic residue and this kind of um, really with a kind of reserve or defamiliarization, um, uh, creating a kind of condition for us to really look again at a site that appears to be transparent, that appears to be revealing itself. And yet at the same time is a site of layered and hidden history. So I find that kind of tension in his work and also the tension around fragmentation in, in terms of narrative and storytelling, um, just uh, such important work um, really of the last um, uh, 30 years that he's been contributing um, to really uh, interrogating photographic practices so and film practices. Uh, in this work, you can see just a little bit more of the Klaat Sassen series, um, and there are four of 11 images of actors that were in the Klaat Sassen film, uh, which featured an event from the from 1865 in BC history, an actual event where um, uh, um, tensions over the building of a railway um, resulted in a um, in a conflict between settlers and Indigenous people from the Chilcotin. Um, and so again, on the right, what looks like almost a set is actually an actual, uh, it is an actual um, site that's been cared for in that region, in the Chilcotin region. Um, and the small image, which you can't see very well, is the Tong building, which also is a kind of documentation of the um, a kind of friendship center and space for Chinese workers looking for solidarity as they also were participating in the gold rush in the labor of the gold rush. So by very quietly pointing out sort of indexing these sites of tension. Um, um, it, this, this project was just meant to really give in a very compressed way, kind of look at um, how Douglas's very many forms of interrogation unfold from this restaging, the impulse to restage, um, photography that looks at a, a kind of portraiture um, of a site, um, as well as really opening up our senses of who has been involved in a particular um, history and why, and why don't we know about some of it much more than we actually do. And of course, that, uh, that work um, is done so powerfully in Douglas's practice. So I might leave it there. I think that's probably five minutes um, just to introduce that exhibition and give you a quick look at it. I apologize for the images, their clarity, um, but hopefully some of you will be able to see the show. Thanks, Lisa. Um, I'm going to ask Reed to talk about um, the the show at the Polygon and also um, in Venice. Thank you very much for the introduction, um, Shio. That was very gracious. Um, uh, my thanks to Moroti as well. And I think Shio will speak a little bit at the end about a, um, a collaboration and a project we're going to be hosting with Black. Um, very shortly. Um, I'll try and keep my comments um, very um, short, but I did want to share some imagery as well. I think um, everybody is clear that the show that is on at the Polygon right now is simultaneously on at the Venice Biennale at the moment. And if I can just Take this and share it. Can folks see that image? Yes, we can see it. Okay, hang on. I'm just going to go to full screen. Um, so I wanted to share a little bit of the a couple of shots from Venice, a couple of shots from Vancouver, just to um, show the sort of distinction and how um, Stan's project was shown in each of those two spaces. And I'll speak, you know, kind of briefly to introduce the project as a whole as well. Um, this um, is, we're looking at is a two screen video installation. We're seeing one of the two screens, um, a project called ISDN which um, features two rappers um, uh, from London, a um, uh, woman named Tremendous and a woman named Lady Sanity, who you're looking at here um, on one screen. A second screen shows two rappers in Cairo, um, Joker and Raptor. They're in, in a constructed dialogue with one another. 
Stan has made a work where each of these two sets of rappers are communicating fictitiously, but um, somewhat seamlessly through his editing process um, across phone lines. ISDN, ISDN is the name for an outdated um, technology that uses phone lines to communicate high bandwidth uh, uh, sound files. It was popularized by studio technicians in the 1990s, still evident, evidently been in use by libraries as a way to communicate um, sound over a great distance. And in Stan's fiction, um, these two rappers in London and the two rappers in Cairo, both of which developed idiomatic um, uh, uh, musical genres um, emerging out of hip hop, in the one case in London, grime, the, the, in the case in Cairo, Maraganet, um, are collaborating, creating uh, a new piece. Um, and uh, there is a, obviously a great deal of technical finesse in the way that this is being presented. But when Stan was invited to do Venice, um, what I really admired about his proposal, which began, you know, with the idea of this piece was that he did not want to speak, you know, prototypically to something that was Canadian. He didn't want to be, he wanted to, do, he wanted to talk about a global condition. And I think that's one of Stan's, you know, at least for me, amazing strengths is the, the way that his view out into the world is conditioned by a deep understanding of local conditions. And Lisa spoke you know, about the way that Stan has unpacked many local underrepresented and unknown stories here in British Columbia. And for BC um, viewers, we are in a particularly privileged place and maybe we can talk about this a little bit more because Stan has provided us you know a new lens on our local histories uh, it is vital important untold and in the process of becoming and that's you know as a curator that's an intense privilege that said Stan you know wanted to bring into Venice something that was not local was not about Vancouver was not about BC, it was not about Canada. The human really wanted to enter into a conversation that was, was global. And the whole premise of 2011 was based on the uprisings and the events and the protests that happened globally across the world that year. And this will make more sense as I come back through the photographs back to the video installation. So I just wanted to show the context of the video installation, which was in this cathedral-like vaulted um, salt cellar called the Magazzini del Sal. And you can just see a figure there dimly in the foreground to get a sense of scale. Um, these were monumental video installations. It was, it was very, very dramatic. And we were quite privileged to have this as a second site, um, uh, independent of the pavilion, the Canadian pavilion and the Giardini, which is usually the only site for an artist to work with. This is a shot of the same work at the Polygon, just to give you a sense that the scale has come down quite a bit. It's a lot more intimate. It's a lot more ground level. And there are pros and cons, I think, um, to the way that um, each has been presented. That's a shot to give you a sense of the two in opposition to one another. And then there is um, the photographs, which are here seen in the Giardini and the Canadian Pavilion. And not a, not a, ter it's a beautiful building. <laughs> it's not the best place to be showing art in, and certainly not a place you can show a video installation. So when Stan was invited, it was like, his immediate reaction was that we will need a second site. We found that pre-COVID, which was uh, fortuitous, but uh, the Polygon show brings both the uh, both sites together into one room. Um, and I can talk more about that. Here you see uh, three of four photographs that Stan showed in the pavilion. 
all restagings of events, um, protests that were happening, as I said, in 2011. On the far right is the riot that happened in the immediate aftermath of the Stanley Cup final that the Vancouver Canucks lost to the Boston Bruins. In the, in the center is a photograph of uh, the riots that happened in the aftermath of the killing of Mark Duggan in London, inside of the UK protest that went across that country and across the whole United Kingdom. In the left is a photograph of Occupy protesters um, being kettled and arrested on the Brooklyn Bridge in New York in the aftermath of the Occupy movement that also went global that year. And there is a fourth photograph. Here's another shot of the Canadian Pavilion, a fourth photograph of the beginning of the Arab Spring in Tunis, which I'm not quite sure I have an image of. Oh, here it is on the left. And this is the shot of the same three, same photographs in the Polygon Gallery. A better shot of the Tunis photograph. A moment at the very beginning of the Arab Spring, before the protests and the riots exploded across North Africa and the Middle East, when the folks were um, occupying streets, having conversations, having a kind of an imaginative idea of a different possibility of governance. And it was kind of a ripe, kind of very pregnant moment before it exploded into violence when the police, as you can faintly see there up on the left um, uh, and the army didn't quite know what to do. Nobody knew who was occupying what at that point. And there's a kind of rich story, I think, that Stan is telling in how space is occupied by whom and um, for what reason that threads itself all through these photographs and indeed through a lot of his work. Incredible detail to the images. And here's a detail of the um, London photograph. These were, these were achieved through an incredible, um, an incredible mix of high resolution photography and staging, much like a film shoot. And again, we can talk about more of that if we get into some of the more technical details. I don't wanna get into too much detail right now because I think folks have a lot of ground to cover elsewhere. We brought a second photograph that Stan had shot um, of the London protests to the Polygon. So there's five photographs there for those who might be able to come down to see. This is a second shot of the protests on Mayor Street near Tottenham. And finally, there's this uh, photograph again of the Stanley Cup riot, which is in some ways a way for me to bring this global conversation back to a local audience and. I have found it particularly provocative to talk specifically about the idiosyncrasy of this image in the context of the other ones. The other ones are very much about, you know, about very specific global um, protests that went from a local context outwards. This one's not. This one's in, in, in the view of many Vancouverites, a bunch of hooligans that had no reason for doing what they were doing. Stan disagrees, I disagree. Stan looks at this as a political act. I agree with that too. And I, I enjoy talking about that. So that's something that I'm curious to hear others' thoughts about as well. So I will leave it there. Thank you very much. Thanks, Reed, for the introduction. I can't wait to kind of go into this more depth um, during our conversation after. Um, so I'm I'm going to pass the mic over to Cheryl, um, who will talk about the recent show of stands at the Phi Foundation. Thanks, Karen. That's um, thanks everybody, Fawn, Lisa, um, for inviting me to be part of this conversation. It's really an honor, and I was really happy to learn more about Black um, incredible initiatives. So this show we had um, called Revealing Narratives. In, at the Phi Foundation in Montreal was held uh, between February 19th and May 22nd. 
And the exciting thing is, is that it is currently on at the Art Gallery of Nova Scotia, and I believe it will be up until November. So we have sort of Stan Douglas from coast to coast, <laughs> which is really a wonderful thing. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about the story because it's kind of strange. We, you know, wanted to do something special for our 15th anniversary. And uh, I, I remember we had inconsolable memories at uh, the foundation. It was called DHC Art back then um, as part of a group show. And it just felt like a really wonderful, interesting opportunity to maybe try and see if, if something with Stan could happen for our 15th. And I'd gotten wind of this new series in early 2021 called Penn Station's Half Century. Um, I wasn't really sure what, you know, what, what could possibly happen, but um, I knew about Venice. And so I contacted Reed <laughs> and asked his advice and, and he was incredibly supportive and encouraging and, and very kindly um, connected us. He said, why, you know, you might as well ask, you never know. Um, and I was very pleasantly surprised to, to see that Stan was willing and, and happy to have a show <laughs> in Montreal um, with Penn Station's Half Century, uh, knowing he was going to be incredibly busy with, with Venice. So I, we're eternally grateful for, for having that have, um, for him having accepted to do that. Um, the uh, Penn Station half, Penn Station's half century consists of nine very large stage photographs, and um, we knew that would sit well in our sort of um, satellite space, which is um, two contiguous galleries. But we also have this four-story vertical space, um, more intimate-sized galleries, and um, it seemed like it might be a really interesting opportunity to pair Penn Station's half century with an older series um, body of work. And um, it was really my secret wish for that to be paired with Disco Angola. And I was trying to think of a way to broach this with Stan knowing he was really busy and, and it would be kind of another thing to, to think through. And um, just in case I'd had uh, our, our technical director plot it out, right, in um, SketchUp, just to see if, if it also would work in that building, because that series um, consists of eight photos, and, and he uh, stand very carefully pairs them in diptychs, and so I thought, ha, huh, we could have, you know, each pair on, on a floor, and, uh, and see how that would sit in the room, because I feel like his works are so rich, um, so detailed that um, it doesn't take a lot, right, to hold a room, to hold a space, and uh, decided to try and take that chance. Um, we hadn't cleared it with him, but somehow we'd ended up sending him um, the SketchUp for the, the layout of Penn Stations, along with the, the layout for Disco Angola. <laughs> and then when I checked in with uh, Linda Chinfin, his uh, studio manager, I said, oh, I'm so sorry we sent you both of those layouts without even asking Stan yet if he was interested in, in having Disco Angola go with Penn Stations, but she's like, he didn't say anything, so maybe it's probably fine, <laughs> and that's how sort of we were able to go ahead with that um, proposal, and I have to say it's probably the most minimal uh, hang we've ever had in, um, in in our gallery spaces, and I was uh, feeling super wonderfully about it until the day before the opening, and then I, that's what happens, right, when you're hosting, the day before you start to panic and wonder, is this okay, and <laughs> will, will, will people feel like it's enough, and then you kind of go back and operate from confidence, you know, and say, yes, yes, it's enough, uh, so that's how the, the show actually came together, um, what it consists of uh, and why it was interesting is that both series are uh, works that are entirely staged photographs, much like um, what's uh, being shown uh, in Venice right now. Uh, they definitely both speak to Stan's interest in linking local symptoms with global conditions, even though he may work with a specific place and time. Um, and a specific event that often may not be well known about or was not sort of easily understood in mass media. Um, you, he brings you into that world and then you start to make associations with uh, the conditions and situations 
um, in your current uh, contemporary context and to see how these things um, resonate with each other, how cause and effect are, um, are, are really close, no matter how, what the distance might be between your situation and the situation that he's presenting. Um, and they both really engage with the me mechanics of representation, which is uh, also really near and dear to his practice and methodology. Um, and looking at how historic events, memory, place will affect people um, politically, culturally, sociologically, and, and also economically. Uh, and Stan, you know, as we see with the, the, the work in, in Venice, that he works with history, but he, and he works with moments and events, but also there's always somehow a soundtrack. There's always sort of a musical element that, that, that sort of emanates from the subject, uh, subjects and places that he works with. And, um, and I thought that bringing these two series also would give an opportunity for that to emerge for, for the visitors. So what you're seeing here is um, uh, an install view of the first floor of the, um, the four-story building where we showed uh, Disco Angola. Uh, and what he's doing is um, imagining that uh, the, that there is a, a photographer, um, a photojournalist in the 1970s who's living in New York City and is uh, really interested in the emerging disco scene happening in New York, late 1970s. And, and reminds, he reminds us of the context. I mean, Stan reminds us of the context of the late 1970s New York, where you've got energy crisis. Um, it's, it's, it's kind of a bleak time uh, economically. Uh, there's all kinds of you know shifts and changes that uh, within New York City's culture itself, and and people are looking for a space, especially um, people from sort of Black and Latinx communities, a place to find some emancipation and freedom. And disco music, which emerges from some funk and soul, and is very um, key uh, to Black and Latinx communities in New York becomes that space of emancipation. And so he's going out, this photo, this fictional photojournalist is going out at night and with a, in taking snapshots of uh, New York City's disco scene. At the same time, this fictional photo, photojournalist is also going to Angola and covering the, um, the civil war there. Angola was colonized by, Por by Portugal and um, the Civil War meant a major exodus of um, uh, Portuguese uh, settlers. And uh, you have a, a pairing of a disco image with an Angola image on every floor. And a lot of the uh, joy and pleasure in reading these things is making these associations both from a, co from a, um, a compositional um, perspective as much as uh, um, the the reading of what's going on, of the content, what's what is he staging, what is and and giving us the opportunity to see these um, events from um, multiple perspectives, and in that way, he always seems to me as being you know really speaking from a diasporic experience. Uh, he talks a lot about the parallax and how you know if you close one eye, you see things one way. If you close the other eye, you can you get a whole set of other bits of information, and so that definitely comes out in this series as well. So, Fawn, if you just want to go to the next image, I'll just show you another install view. This was on the um, this was on the second floor. So, on the left, you have the disco image, which is called Two Friends who uh, seem like they're waiting for something, definitely in a liminal space. They seem a little bored even. Um, and uh, my reading uh, of it was uh, thinking of how the, um, the di how disco music became colonized, right? By the music industry and uh, very much changed from being something coming from the root of a, of a real, of a really grassroots um, place to being sort of appropriated by uh, commercial music industry. And that these are sort of some of maybe the latecomers to the scene who maybe the bridge and tunnel crowd, whatever, and sort of wondering if, you know, so what's, what's it all about anyways? 
And then on the uh, right hand side, you have a luta continua, which is an image of a woman standing in front of a mural and with a very ambivalent look on her face. And um, given the shifts and changes of alliances uh, happening during the, uh, the Angolan Civil War, um, of, and these nuances of which we had, you know, here in, say, in our context in North America, we had very little real uh, sense of what was going on, and it was changing all the time, and it was very, very hard to follow. The ambivalence of her face kind of reveals a certain um, sense of how you don't know which side she may be on as well. So that that also becomes an interesting um, perspective or point of view, especially from uh, a photojournalist who who may um, often be compelled by editors or whatever to present a very specific point of view, and yet this is this is the one that uh, that we're faced with. And also, there's the thing about time. You're not sort of really sure whether um, you know, knowing that they're staged photographs, or even not knowing that they're staged photographs, that there's something contemporary um, in these images that also you know is is very much in in keeping with. Uh, with the period in which they were um, meant to be, um, the period that's that's being presented. So I thought that was all, you know, a really interesting point about uh, or what's you know what comes out of Disco Angola. So fine, we'll just go to the next, the next one. So in the other building, this is um, uh, install view from Penn Station's Half Century, and in this, uh, Stan. Um, worked with uh, researchers who went through oh, just tons and tons of archives so that he could sort of pinpoint and select nine particular moments um, in the history of Penn's, Penn Station, which only actually existed from 1910 to 1963, and then was eventually demolished to make way for Madison Square Garden. And so he, um, worked with CGI and uh, stage photography using you know, over 400 actors and costumes to sort of stage each of these specific events. Um, some of them long forgotten, some of them never having really been known. Um, and then the last image, Vaughn, is just a, um, yeah, just sort of another view of, uh, of those images, which uh, are in a historic building in Montreal as well. So there was an interesting uh, sort of physical um, confrontation of uh, the, the physical past uh, and people being in that room in old Montreal, which is also the historic part of the city, um, in communion with uh, these images that, that have been reconstructed but also with, with Stan's particular eye, particular way of composing um, so that we have yet another way of uh, interpreting and understanding these events in time. I think I forgot to mention, yeah, that, the, the <laughs> that this was a commission and the commissioned a set of works are at the Moynihan train station in New York City. And, um, uh, they hadn't all been produced for that presentation. And so we were really pleased to be able to bring them all together physically and in, in, into one exhibition. And um, yeah, just sort of uh, tickled that, uh, that this could also go to Halifax. So thank you very much. Thanks, Cheryl. Thank you all, all three for your short presentations. And um, I have a few questions that I'm just going to ask uh, to all of you. And then I know that there's probably a lot of questions from um, our audience and from yourselves. Um, I guess, first of all, um, just thinking about the meticulous research, um, you know, in the archival materials, references to historic moments. Um, how do how do viewer how should do viewers respond or know where to look for the references? Like, is it the idea that um, the viewer there's a collaboration between the viewer and the artist, that like uh, the viewer and Stan, um, where each brings um, their own time and labor and reflection to the artwork? Um, I'm just uh, you know, are, are there what are the tools to help them decode? Um, for example, I guess um, since it's the the Phi Foundation, that was the show that I went to see. Um, that 
there's just the, the titles, um, which are the dates. Um, and so that's one clue. And I'm just curious about how else that um, viewers can kind of come into the work and, and understand or, or catch those references. Um, sorry, Karen, do you, would you, is this directed to any one of us or would you I'm like directing to it to all of you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Cheryl might have a different view of this. Um, the intention to historical accuracy and detail in Stan's photographs, I think, as many people know, is extremely acute. Um, you mentioned the level of research that goes into this. I mean, Stan often, you know, like, you know, spends months researching um, any one historical event, um, as he did uh, the history of the Moynihan train station, as he did, um, you know, in the case of the photographs are at the Polygon right now, and in Venice, you know, each of the the kind of the histories of the the large global events that he wanted to depict. Then there comes a point of choice. I mean, you're choosing to, you know, interpret the Arab Spring. Where do you even begin? You know, shooting, you know, the Stanley Cup riot, you have one specific moment on one specific street in one specific town. So it narrows your choice down. But, you know, when you're talking about a global event that happened, you know, in multiple cities, as did, you know, the uh, Occupy movement, um, it becomes, you know, uh, a larger exercise. I, I might be skirting your question exactly, but, you know, what was interesting to me in talking to Stan about that was, you know, how much he keyed off some of the anecdotal conversations that he was having with the folks that were helping him do the research. And in their research and in their interviews with people that were there at the time, first person narratives became key to that image. You know, there's no particular written history about the moments in advance, to my knowledge, there could be, but to my knowledge, you know, a lot of his, uh, a lot of his reason for doing that photograph emerged out of conversations with people that were in Tunis and with his research conversations with pe people in Tunis about this right moment before, the, um, you know, the events uh, resulted in riots and violence that, you know, there was this moment of utopic hope where people were gathering on the streets and were, were you know, sitting thinking about, you know, possibilities. To my knowledge, there's no picture of that. At least I have not seen one. So that image is of a very specific place at a very specific time, but it's an imagination. It's of an imagination based on an oral history. So, you know, it's not a slavish interpretation of something that was like this person was there, or that person was there. Or, you know, in that image, as is much of Stan's work, I think it begins in history and then enlarges into art. And, you know, there's, there's I think, a real provocative intelligence at work when you when you start to look in detail about his images and his work so um i i don't think i answered your question <laughs> that's what brought to mind so i'd be interested to hear what cheryl has to say well yeah no i actually do totally see that i mean history is is constructed right Generally, I think a lot of historians would say that. Um, and although there is the the um, historical uh, research and archival research are definitely part of the basic materials, but um, the images are imagined and realized. There may be images of reference, perhaps, or in uh, um, in in the archives, but those are not what are being. Um, 
uh, created. It's another perspective. It's another way of, um, of imagining that, that moment, but the details are extremely specific. Um, the other thing that uh, I think was interesting, and it was a question I was going to ask everybody as well, was you know about Stan's preference for uh, low to no didactic. So um, a preference not to have wall texts or or even labels, and um, we <laughs> like like wanting to sort of push the a little bit of those experimentations uh, forward. We actually did not have anything on the walls. So we had everything in a gallery guide. <laughs> um, and uh, we were sort of wen wondering how um, that was going to go over, I guess, with our visitors. And uh, I would say what was really, um, we didn't really receive any, any negative feedback around that. And it made me think about something else I'd read uh, that Stan had said about um, looking at images and not really needing to have to have all the background information um, and, and basically being um, uh, viewers, you know, so kind of contemporary viewers, it's our knowledge of looking at television and film and kind of other mass media that inform our reading. So we kind of can feel confident knowing that we have a lot of the building blocks of, of what's required to, to um, read and enjoy these images and then actually to think later, because they do stay with you. They're, they're incredibly powerful. And you wonder, um, you know, sort of what, uh, how that sort of carries on into your own reading of uh, what's going on in your world today. Um, but I, I do think that um, we didn't, you know, not, not having even the titles, <laughs> not even having the titles of the works on the walls to be pretty, uh, a, real, uh, a real extension, a, a, sort of a real major ask for, for the viewers. And I'm glad that we did it because it gave us a sense of what the, you know, sort of the outer extremes are of, of um, you know, providing tools. And I think, you, you know, we, we think that there are tools to provide. Um, but it, I also do kind of love how it looked to not have um, the, you know, sort of little, not to have tombstone information on the cartels on the walls, because it really did just in zero, zero um, distractions. You, you're just confronted with the image and then you can relax and just look at the image. <laughs> Is, is this the case at the Polygon to read um, and in Venice? Um, no, we did do a didactic panel um, as well as wall labels, um, but there's minimal information beyond that other than Stan's words. Yeah. Um, what we did at the Polygon was, uh, was produce the lyrics to the ISDN as a monumental, you know, kind of super graphic on the uh, stair landing so that once you exit the exhibition, um, you can take the opportunity to kind of read um, the lyrics of the two sets of rappers as you as you go out. Um, a lot of people are taking advantage of that. It's, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's been an interesting facet of that um, to see that language as a kind of didactic panel. And those were written by the rappers. They weren't written by Stan, you know. So in 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 as Stan's, you know, uh, work with the musicians in particular, it, you know, is is very much a collaboration, very much working with them as as artists themselves. And one facet of his of his work that I I I really admire and um, I'm really pleased about our presentation of that. What's fascinating to me is that in bringing the ISDN together with the photographs at the Polygon, which it wasn't in Venice, you know, there are, we've had some comments from folks who have not complained, but they, they find that the music is a bit too loud in the context of trying to look at the photographs and, and as a, as a kind of contemplative space. So there's this, this kind of 
you know, movement from this music piece into this gallery spot where we've heard, you know, kind of like, if I'm going to look at the photographs, I need it to be quiet, which I found quite interesting. I mean, some people are more sensitive to sound. I wanted it to be a lot louder than it is. And, you know, Stan probably gratefully kept it toned down a little bit, but, um, you know, I look at those things and I think, you know, Cheryl, you pointed out too, there's a soundtrack to Stan's work. And in our case, it's literally a soundtrack. And I see the soundtrack as integral to the space that the photographs sit in and listening to that soundtrack as you look at those images. But clearly some folks don't agree with me on that one. I, I guess like while Stan really addresses um, race head on many of his works, incorporates like music as you said music um or historically black music like jazz afrobeat disco um and in a way i guess what we can say perhaps like in the space of um, polygon it's like the space of cultural resistance or music music as a space of cultural resistance um and um I guess I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the ISDN um, video installation and um, kind of the call and response interaction where it's uh, seemingly um, in real time um, or, or real, re I don't know how to say, um, but it's actually not. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. Um, yeah, happy to. Um... Yeah, I mean, you know, and again, to, you know, give maybe the whole show a little bit more context. I mean, the, and Stan speaks very, very transparently about the photographs being a somewhat pessimistic view of what happened in 2011, in the sense of like, a lot of these protests, the, uh, you know, Occupy movement, uh, you know, the UK uprising, the riots across the United Kingdom, the Arab Spring, all, you know, were, were effectively repressed and, ignored, policed in the case of North America and Europe, um, you know, uh, much worse um, in many cases, folks, you know, were in, and are in prison in the Arab world. And the conditions under which those protests happened and, you know, the, perhaps the, you know, the utopian trajectory of what they were proposing has in some cases gotten, you know, even worse. So the question is like, you know, where did those things go? What has happened? And I think that's a kind of central question of Stan's work, but, um, and that piece, which, you know, we could go into a longer conversation about. ISDN proposes something different in the sense that, you know, Grime and Maharaganat were in essence, you know, quote, the soundtrack to the protests that were happening in the UK and in the Arab Spring or in Cairo, at least at that time. So there, there are sounds that emerge out of, you know, out of the street, um, genres that were sort of dismissed, but then through, uh, through, you know, the popularity of people um, sharing it and, um, and kind of the youth who were listening to them, they, they grew in prestige and to the point of becoming unignorable by the powers that be. the creation of a dialogue between these two you know folks in london and two in cairo is an entire fiction it's both a fiction and its construction in the sense that you know the the the, the rappers in london were shot um independent of the ones in cairo um stan shot them back to back over the course of two weeks traveling from one studio to the other he shot them on location um but they were listening to, uh, you know, a, 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 just a click track. So they weren't even listening to the music that is being played in that. They were just rapping on top of that. And that's one, you know, advantage, I guess, advantage of uh, hip hop is that, you know, the, the lyrics and the, and the music and the beats behind it can somehow be dissynchronous. It's the beat that is the thing that, you know, the, the rap goes to, not necessarily the 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 effects track or the or the or the you know the rhythm tracks. 
so they were singing to something that is not there. And what's more, through the process of editing, Stan brought those two things into conversation. So it's an entirely fictitious construct. But it's also a fictitious construct to imagine these two rappers in two different cities speaking and having a dialogue. That in and of itself, thematically it's a construct, you know, formally it's a construct. The, the fiction that it proposes that, that there is a dialogue across cities, across time, across space, that, you know, is something that can actually result in a creative plus plus, as opposed to the protest that resulted in, you know, something that was dismissed and or, or policed or destroyed. So those plus and minus that I think was mentioned before operate in tandem, you know, and I think, again, it's like, you know, the, the, metaphor of one eye, the parallax, one eye being closed and other opens is very kind of central to a lot of Stan's projects and central to this piece as well. So I mean, I like that metaphor a lot. So. Thanks. Um, I guess I, I'm just gonna ask one last question before I let you guys kind of have the conversation. Um, was just this idea of location in sight um, and, um, I guess sort of two parts or three parts of this question. One was um, like at least at the Griffin, um, some of the the works um, are images of of spaces of, of places, um, and that's void of people. Um, uh, you know, the absence of the body, um, and I guess the focus on on the location itself, and from what I understand what you had just said um, in your presentation that they're that some of them there are the actual locations and so it's not state like it's not a staged um, site um, and I was wondering if you could talk about that a little and then um, perhaps too for for Cheryl and and for um, Lisa about Penn Station um, the because I, I know that at the Griffin you're showing the behind the scenes of the making of that a bit, um, sort of like, and 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 I'm going to bring Reed into about um, the staging of um, the photographs of where the location of where they're being staged or, or shot at. Does that factor in to the reading of the work in, in the sort of sort of the, the final kind of um, image of that? Um, and I yeah okay, I'm going to stop there and let you. to say just one one thing about that looking at the Penn Station of course I just saw the documentary so I haven't been able to see the uh, the works themselves yet but it was really interesting to see the um so that was shot in a in the um hockey in a hockey arena here in Vancouver um because we didn't there was no access of course Penn Station not you know being removed but I thought about it in terms of the ghost of this architectural space and how interesting that is to see um, this restaging um, in the way that there's a kind of um, that same quality in the circa 1948 where you have these kind of um, ephemera standing in for um, both an architectural site and also a, a, a dialogue in that space. Um, so I guess just, you know, it's, it's a great question. I'm gonna let others who, you know, worked more closely with Stan talk about that but I just wondered about that myself actually in the work this sort of sense of this disappearance or this kind of ephemera that is actually around a really incredibly important history that then disappears as these sites um, go away which is also in some of Stan's other work as well so just a comment more than anything um, and then and then around that question of labeling I just wanted to mention that I think that the labels themselves, just the way that the titles are, are kind of an invitation. Um, so a specific date might be there. I love the double dating of the actual making of the image and then the, the reference point to, if you're curious enough, you could go back and look at that history of that place at that time. And I really like that open-endedness of just sort of falling into it and saying, well, what, what was this place? What, what was happening at this time? And and you know, leaving that with the viewer to decide 
if they're going to go down the rabbit hole and, and be curious enough to, to find out more about those sites. So I'll hand it over to others. Hmm. Um, yeah, the, I was just going back to thinking back again uh, to Penn Station and, and uh, the, uh, the very palpable aura um, that comes through because, yeah, as I mentioned, the uh, Penn Station had to be done in CGI, basically. Well, I mean, you know, there are Im images that, that uh, exist, but, and the, um, the actors were, were staged in the Agrodome and uh, they were, uh, it was during the pandemic as well. So there was all that to negotiate. And uh, so in, in orchestrating all of that, and it is a, you know, quite um, Hollywood proportions uh, production um, is, is, a, is an incredible feat in itself. But then when you're faced with the image, it, it um, completely transports you. And the other thing that we notice is that there's really flat depth of field that there's, that even the tiniest, um, uh, say a pen, you know, sitting on a, on a, on a, the desk of uh, one of those, uh, you know, a kiosk is in perfect focus. <laughs> it's like unbelievable, you know, it's like virtuosic uh, and, and the scale of the works too, the dimensions of them are, you know, such that, such that they're completely immersive as well. And so you, you do get into this space where you inhabit simultaneously the present and the past. It's, it's unbelievable. <laughs> and then when you start to kind of delve into the subject um, or the themes that, that Stan has been grappling with all this time, and you, you get a sense of the utopic as well. You know, the, the, uh, the desire for something um, modern and grand and like taking on the technological and that sort of being the thing that is going to lift us up as a civilization to the next level. And then knowing that Penn Station um, started to, you know, as a train station, started to um, uh, decline as the aviation industry took off. And, uh, you know, the, in one of the images, you see a desire for um, the you know, the, the uh, um, I guess, tourism by air connect with, you know, um, tourism by train. So you could take like, you could go across the United States by taking partially a train and partially an airplane. And like, you know, that was kind of the beginning of the end really for, for um, Penn Station, which had, you know, was in itself such a, a site of, of great advancement for uh, for for people, transportation, getting to know you know your country becoming smaller, linking industry, linking business, as well as you know um, individuals across the country. So um, I don't know what I'm saying really. I, I <laughs> what's that all? How it how it sort of ties back to to your question, Karen? But there is definitely something about about how. Uh, he he conveys sort of site and location so uh, marvelously through these 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 works. Yeah, I mean Cheryl, I think you know one of the things that I'm speaking with Stan. I haven't seen the Penn Station photographs, so I don't I don't I don't know what they look like, and I haven't been to New York, I haven't been to Montreal, but you know, I was at the Agrodome when he was shooting that, you know, and what was. And then, then again, uh, you know, for the for the Venice pieces, and what was astonishing is that you know there's there's you know you're in the middle of this just giant cavernous space. It's a concrete floor. They've gridded it out with the actors who, as you say, are you know in the middle of COVID, so they have to social distance. They can't, can't even get together, so they're having to shoot you know different people at different times and layer them all together. So it's it's a multi 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 you know exposure process to get you know this composite Im image of all of these folks staged dimensionally and perspectively in the way that they could be lifted out of that and plopped into the actual image itself which in the case of Penn Station is an entirely digital construct in the in Venice pieces it's it's an existing plate shot that Stan has taken you know at the sites themselves <laughs> sorry dog um, 
what's what's astonishing, and I think you know something you're kind of trying to get at is that you know in in the Agrodome, all you have is all these characters in costume standing in a in a concrete bunker. They have no context. They have, you know, all they have is Stan's direction and trust in Stan that, you know, when it all comes together, it's going to be this beautiful atmospheric and historical image, which it is, you know, but the only place that that exists is in, you know, kind of in Stan's brain as he's, as he's taking this and in compositing those two things together in your mind before they actually get together in the, in the computer. So it is to me an astonishing feat of artistry that Stan was able to make images with such historical atmosphere with these actors in in uh, in a place that you know is an entirely fictitious arena you know in a kind of larger sense so i, I don't know if i'm i'm adding any depth or color to your your question but you know it, it was i just it was so funny being in the agrodome and you know watching these van these vancouver canucks you know, fans coming together with these New York police officers and these young folks dressed, you know, the, when they're for a sit-in in Tunis, all commingling and sort of sitting together. And it's like, you know, it was this kind of palimpsest of, of histories all together there that I thought was like, you know, I wish I'd taken more photographs of that. Anyway, background detail. Well, thank you for your your um your answers and i'm going to ask you to ask each other questions if maybe um lisa you could start you're muted lisa sorry i have um one question which was um i was really curious about the locations for where each of the wrappers are are in the Venice project and um, and by the way congratulations um, on all of that all of the complexity of that project and bringing that to such uh, fruition in Venice and then again here in Vancouver. Um, I just thought looking at the location of the London the wrappers that are in London they're in one of those community centers and it's such a symbolic space. Um, where these were the sort of hubs that were built, I think, you know, post-war to really support youth. And there was a great investment in those spaces. Um, and then of course, during austerity, those, those spaces became stripped down. And so there wasn't anywhere for youth to really hang out in the same way. And so that kind of return to the street or the sense of threat on the street or the, the way that that urban space was starting to be recalibrated by the time those riots happened um, it just feels like that was such a thoughtful decision to make that the source that they're um, transmitting from. And I don't know enough about the hotel in Tunis. And I just wondered if you might have any um, background on that location decision. It's a great question. I don't, I don't, you know, where and how I know that there was a great deal of work to secure the locations in Cairo. Um, and you're right, they're, they're very much liminal spaces that are, you know, were once something and are now something else. And I think both spaces in that are, are very much, you know, very much that. Um, so I can't, I don't think I could add anything, you know, um, more to that question, you know. Um, what's, what's, you know, somewhat, tangential to the question but i think you know interesting still nonetheless is the you know the plate shot for the two london photographs that stan took and he did these before venice so they were done in 2017 so only six years after the events that they depict and they were taken by you know a helicopter from you know quite a, and a high resolution um image taken from a helicopter you know, in, in many ways, what Stan was trying to do is create this, this large scale depictive panorama of, you know, an event. And he had that in mind, in fact, for all the other photographs, but, you know, it proved to be way too difficult to do that, you know, particularly in Tunis. Um, thus the image that ended up resolving. But he has this giant canvas. Um, and in those two photographs, he's, he's then picking 
people out of news footage and repositioned them back into the street that they were they were plopped out of. So it's distinct from the other photographs from the Penn Station photographs and from the three other photographs in Venice in the sense that they were using existing actual people that were in the riot repositioned into the London streets, but in a much more grand and panoramic way, as I said. They had to do a great deal of CGI work to return the image of London from 2017 to 2011. It was like it had been gentrified a lot in the course of those six years. You know, coffee shops, and, you know, and, and renovations and um, that particular part of London had, you know, been transformed in many ways. So they were using a lot of extant, you know, news image to see what it looked like at 2011 and then redoing it to make it historically accurate. So very much, you know, characteristic of Stan's attention to detail but also, I think, you know, speaks to the changing fabric of the cities and, you know, what trajectory some of those places are moving in now, as opposed to where they came from in, you know, the 60s and 70s when those when those community centers were built. So, yeah, I'm not, again, answering your question clearly, but maybe, you know, adding a bit more um, color to it. Mm -hmm. Cheryl. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I was going to ask you, Lisa, um, a little bit about uh, your own process in, in researching Stan's work, because it's such a huge body of work, and it, and it seems like you've been um, you know, really mining it to put together this, this show. Um, yeah, tell me a little bit, tell us a little bit about that process. Yeah, thank you. And it did feel like, um, you know, it just it's just it's just what could happen within the the space and um trying really to balance it out and create something as you were talking about um um at the phi where you had a spaciousness around the work so there's just a challenge formally to try and create something that was a through line um but i also felt that probably most audiences in vancouver would have seen all of the work so i was actually really happy to hear that there were some pieces that were new for people um, particularly the uh, Marnie photographs, I think um, they're, they're from the Vancouver Art Gallery collection. And sometimes what happens with these sort of smaller works or, you know, they can be, um, you know, the grander works get the attention, but then these works really reveal, I think, something about a thinking process too. So I was uh, curious about that and wanting to, to really show that breadth and of course that's not the beginning of thinking about it that way but it's certainly an early example of that questioning that narrative order and questioning the storytelling um and quite simply done compared to what comes afterward so i really like that piece for how it just shows that kind of origin story of, of thinking about um how a film could be sort of captured and repurposed and how that text might work um, and I really like the text in the the way that the text works in the um, Polygon exhibition as well, for example, where you get to see another iteration of how um, how the text might animate some kind of narrative, but that one's happening in real time. Um, but also like the mystery behind it, as Reed was talking about, that they're actually not in conversation with each other. So some of those little pieces are in the beginnings of those works, which I think is really um, interesting. And a lot of it was, um, an education for me as well because I'm recently I've been in Vancouver for a few years now but not during some of those major exhibitions at the Vancouver Art Gallery so to see some of these film works I've seen some of them but not all of them um, so it really was just uh, looking at what was possible um, what was possible in the space and also trying to create a kind of coherence so looking for those spaces that like the Valentine Pier and Las Terrasas works for example where you have these kind of very austere looking frontices of the art, these architectural kind of um, frontis, frontices that are actually standing in for this other, um, you know, um, a kind of labor history. And so even though the works formally look quite different, um, I really liked the way that they have that kind of conversation. So I was really looking for those things that happened 
quite naturally with the work that was available for me to work with, um, but also um, that it wasn't, because it wasn't showing only one full series, it was showing these different pieces, it was maybe an opportunity to show that kind of linkage between a number of series in that way. So, you know, I really just hope that the audience enjoys that or, it, or that that's there. And I'm actually really curious about how that feels because it's a really different way to look at his work with, outside of a very immersive installation or a series that are, um, so to see just a number of pieces and maybe look at where the vectors intersect. Um, you know, I certainly found it interesting as I was researching it. So hopefully that brings something to. Thanks for that question. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. I mean, of course, Reed, I want to know how, I mean, we, you know, when we saw each other in Venice, it was very much in passing. You were, you know, you had so much, your um, responsibility, not only as a curator, but also kind of as a, an ambassador, a diplomat. Um, there were a lot of things going on and, and duties that you were, um, you know, that you stepped up to marvelously. And so, uh, you know, how do you feel now? <laughs> Oh, thank you for that. That's a nice compliment. Um, you know, it was it's interesting because one thing that I haven't talked about with ISDN is that it's it's permutative. Well, I did mention that, but you know, and I, here I am six months down the road and I still can't quite get the explanation of this right. But the all of the different tracks in that work. There's a rhythm track, there's an effects track, there's the lyrics, and there's one other track. Um, see, I can't get it right. Um, are all on different time signatures. So like other works of Stan's um, in music in particular, it's and in you know other video works, it's it's always in the process of reimagining and remaking itself. And what we understand is it would take about two weeks for the work to sort of end up repeating. You can kind of get it in about 20 minutes because the drone shots that Lisa, you spoke about that show the studios happen at episodically at about 20 minute inter intervals. Um, in Venice, you're in the middle of this like blah, where you're no, you, you don't really even have time to spend with the work. At the Polygon, you know, I've got to actually live with the work now for the last month and been going in and talking to people and, and visiting the work. And it's like, it's really astonishing how much ISDN changes and the mood that it creates, even though it is, you know, a one, one piece, one song, it's a different work, you know, day to day. And that has been a real unexpected luxury of just sitting with it. And not having all that responsibility, being able to just be the kind of curator that lives with it. So it's been very re rewarding for me, you know, to be able to have the work, you know, in the building and to listen to it, to be experience it as a visitor as much as a curator. So that's been, yeah, that's been a lot of fun. Thank you for that. Reed, do you have questions for Lisa? Um, and Cheryl? Well, Lisa and I have had a nice conversation about, you know, being able to share, um, you know, the space of two, two galleries for doing this. Um, so that's been a, that's been a real privilege. So I wanted to thank you, Lisa, for um, your conversation over the last little while. I guess my only question to Cheryl is, I am curious how the reaction in, in Montreal has been to, to Stan's work. I mean, it's, you know, um, I know it's, Stan has, has shown in Montreal before, so he's not new to the city, but has there, like like for me, having somebody remark about, you know, the sound of the photographs as being dissynchronous. I'm just wondering if there's been any surprises for you in, in the reaction of folks um, to seeing his work in Montreal. There, it was actually, it seemed, you know, to be, to go over fairly well. Um, I think there was, it, it was a, a, an interesting time of year, you know, it's, it was, it was the winter season moving into spring and there was a, um, I guess, a, sort of a slight moment of coming out of hibernation um, that uh, seemed to kind of work well with, uh, with the viewing mood. Um, it was more me, 
I'm the one that was <laughs> really concerned that we were not providing the, um, uh, I guess, uh, points of entry into the show because you, it's, I think it's part of the hosting um, situation, you know, the hosting head that you get where you're like, are you okay? Are you, in, you know, is there anything I can do? Can I get you anything? <laughs> and, um, uh, and so when I would, you know, go through the, through the galleries and, and see people sort of um, all, there was all variety of, uh, um, I guess, uh, reading activation posture that I saw. You know, some people were definitely, if, it, if they were with someone, they were definitely um, consulting, you know, the, the, uh, the gallery guide and, and asking questions of each other and, oh, this must be that. And <laughs> um, this must be Burt Williams, the vaudeville, you know, um, leader. Uh, uh, this must be... Um, uh, the bobbed hair bandit, you know, so they, so they were, they were, they were definitely engaging with the tools that we did have, but then there were also people who were completely not, they didn't have anything in their hands and they were, they were, they were just uh, sort of happy to, to um, uh, be engaged with, uh, with the content. Um, so I, I guess it was okay. You know, my, my only, <laughs> my only assumption was that to not have any clues. I mean, we didn't even have um, yeah, like I mentioned, cartels with the titles on the walls, which in retrospect might have been an okay thing because, you know, um, Stan is, is, you, is, is totally fine, you know, with, with working with curators and, and with what they suggest for their spaces, you know, it, it's not, he, there's no insistence on these things at all. It's, uh, it's more of, a, of, a, of just a, a preference. And so um, if I were to do it again, maybe that would be something I would do differently. Uh, it would be to even just have the the titles because you know as Lisa and, and you have pointed out they they reveal a few a few interesting tidbits of information that uh, can enhance the reading or um, you know sort of have you gain entry um, you know quite quite quickly and uh, at the same time I'm like you know getting it is not the issue it's it's not about you know do you um, do all the points of information align in which, you know, you have this ideal viewing. So um, trying to find that sweet spot uh, is, my, I guess, my, my hosting concern <laughs> as a curator, but I, I think by and large, um, the, the show was well received. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for asking. Congratulations to you three. <laughs> on, on um, the shows this year. Um, and I think maybe we'll just open up the space to for audience questions. Yeah, thank you, Karen. Um, I think I'm gonna start with the one question that we have ready to go. This is for uh, anyone who would like to answer. It's a very open question and it's from Juan Contreras. Um, Juan asks, how or what drives Stan Douglas to select his projects? That might be a question best for Stan. <laughs> um, I'll talk, I'll, I'll uh, offer one anecdote just in response to that, just in the context of something that I've already kind of opened up about the project for Venice, you know, and uh, I, I spoke about it as, you know, this kind of two, you know, this dialectical situation between these images of these protests were happening globally and, and something that's much more intimate, these two musicians collaborating um, and making music together, you know, so in some sense, they're very, very different things, but they approach this commonality about, um, which is opened up by the title, 2011 does not equal 1848. So 1848 was a moment when there was uprising across Europe. Um, it's often called the springtime of nations because there was a kind of democratic fervor that was happening that got suppressed at the time, but ended up um, in the establishment of democracies and nation states. So it was, an, it was you know, a, a ripe moment that Stan sees in these global events in 2011, a comparison. 
what brought Stan to wanting to depict those events in 2011 is something that I can't answer. You know, that would be a question that you know only he could he could do. So I can't put words in his mouth. But I like what he says about wanting to not be quote unquote Canadian about his approach to taking a conversation into a global arena. I like the fact that he none, nonetheless used something very specific to his hometown as part of that equation, this, this riot um, in June of that year. I like the way that it divides itself between you know, these depictive realist, almost documentary interpretations of events with all this you know, great historical accuracy. And to some degree, this kind of music video. But I look at that video, I look at ISDN as, as, you know, and I think this points back to a lot of Stan's work as kind of a science fiction. Even though it's set in the past, it imagines a potential future that hasn't happened. It imagines, uh, you know, a possibility of these two musicians rooted in a, in a specific time and place, but making something that, you know, is, you know, a completely imaginative idea. You know, and in my experience of a lot of Stan's work, he takes that proposition of like, you know, even though it didn't happen, what if, what if it had happened? And he takes that to its logical conclusion. It's not like just a, you know, a, a kind of a riff that he's making. And it's like, you know, what happened if, if you know, the course of events, the course of history went this way and that way. He's invented a world. He's invented a potential history. He's invented an alternate history. And that, you know, is, is you know a provocation i think to viewers you know we're not we're not in this history it's not carrying us along we have the capacity and this goes back to the question i think maybe a better answer to that question about what 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 is provided a viewer i think what's provided a viewer is the opportunity to imagine potential futures that we are all participants in and we all have agency in you know and that to me is you know when Stan lands on a project like this and gets it, you know, that's, that's what it's telling us that, you know, futures are not fixed. You can make them up. We can, you know, we have agency in that. So that's kind of my take on that question. Others might think differently. Agree. <laughs> Okay, if, um, we can move on from that question. We have a question coming up from Morati. Morati, for uh, people in the audience, uh, is the curator at Black. Uh, so Morati, please uh, ask your question. Um, hi, that was so good. Thank you all so much for the amazing talk. Um, I wanted to ask about the historical imagination and um, positionality with regards to Stan Douglas's work, as well as um, just the lack of didactic text um, that you have all spoken about um, in today. So when I walk to school, I go to the School for Contemporary Arts in SFU, and outside it is the huge um, piece, Abatan West Cordova, and it's, um, it's it's a very it's a beautiful piece and i recently found out that it was actually um constructed um for some reason i thought that it was archival in a sense um and i just wanted to ask like how do you think that the viewers of um stan douglas's work whether in a gallery or in a public space like the um woodward building outside of a place in, in a place like the downtown east side where so much is going on, um, are able to think about their positionality and what roles that they would have played in the, these histories that um, Stan Douglas is imagining when they encounter the works without um, didactic texts and all.
I I do have an answer to that, or at least a thought about that. I don't want to I don't want to be, um, you know. Um, but you know, it's just an, it's another it's another you know incredibly interesting facet of of Stan's project to me is the way that it depicts space. You know, and the when I first saw the Abbott and Cortova photograph, it was just he was. You know, I, it sat really uncomfortably with me because it didn't address what I thought a picture of a riot should look like. You know, it was like effectively empty in the middle of it. And then it had these young folks, you know, kind of running through the screen, you know, and the riot effectively was on the peripheral of the whole image, like the police on horseback, the paddy wagons. Um, you know, they were forcing, arresting people to one side. There was two little kids sitting on a curb, are sitting on a curb, looking at it, spectating effectively, not feeling threatened at all. So what it says about, you know, a riot is is almost antithetical. You know, it didn't it didn't show it, what I think was a riot is something where there's a giant conglomeration of human activity at the center of it, and you know the peripheral the periphery as you get toward the edges starts to get more evaporated. This was the reverse. All the all the activity is on the edge, and the middle is like vacant. <clears throat> and it's you know it's not a depiction of a it's a depiction of a police riot. The police were the ones who instigated. The police were the ones who, who, who for no reason decided that they're going to wade in and, and arrest these young folks who are in the middle of a sit-in. And in all of the images of Stan's depictions of protests and riots, there is a similar kind of confusion or sense of ownership over the space in the in the image, sometimes it's a direct confrontation, particularly in the in the UK images between the 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 police and the rioters. But even then, they're kind of in a standoff. They're at the opposite ends of a street, kind of holding territory. In the Tunis photograph, it's you know young folks just sitting in the middle of the street, and the police not wondering what to do. In Vancouver, it's a whole freeze of rioters with no police in it. You know. The police have evacuated, and then the moment of that depiction, they've all left, and they're about to come back. Long story short, it's like it's about who owns space, whose space is this? And to me, the answer, one of the answers to your question, is that Stan is suggesting that space is is a contest. And when I talked about the Vancouver riot with him, and I said it was a riot, he said, "No, it's not a riot. It's an occupation." other people that have been disenfranchised are occupying space, if just for a minute. But having occupied it, and this might you know, mean more in other contexts than it does in Vancouver, you've opened up the arena of possibility. You've taken away just temporarily who owns that space and who gets to call it theirs. And he calls that a political act in the case of the Vancouver thing. And I think that's a very interesting provocation. So as a viewer, you know, and I certainly can't speak for anybody other than myself, it just opens up the possibility of a, a question about ownership of space and power and control. And I think those are, you know, those are big topics, but, you know, all of the images kind of lead one to that question. So interesting, Reed, and um, thinking about site as well, like, the way that the scale of the image works in that sense to occupying space and being so insistent, like where it's located at, at SFU. Um, and I would just, I guess a question I would have is about this quality, even though it sort of might appear to be an archival photograph, they are such brilliant, clean, pristine images, um, that, which seems to mitigate against that. Um, it also seems to put it in a bit of the arena of the history painting as well, because there is a sense of organization, organization of form and color and that kind of real formality to the images that um, I think, you know, holds that other, that other kind of documentation in of the history painting and, um, and the kind of, you know, the way that the history painting would have sort of cheats in it, like you'd have, you know, um, I think there was a, uh, 
a, a Dutch engraver who sort of showed himself in a small boat looking up at this war, which is a completely impo implausible position for him to be in as the archiver of what was going on. But yet there he was, the artist in the middle of this scene. Um, you know, so um, Stan doesn't do that, but he does, I think, nod to that formality. And I think putting it in that trajectory of the history painting and mitigating against it too, because it's such a Western practice, that history that painting. Um, I think that I find that really interesting too about this work. Listening to you both speak has really um, triggered some other thoughts for me. I, um, definitely the Penn Station's half century photos do def can be read as history paintings. Um, but I was thinking about agency and and who's who takes space and who has space and it made me think of exodus which is um, one of the images in disco angola and one of the images that um you know from just casually interacting with visitors in the gallery they felt the most staged and it um made it i was looking at it and thinking about how how even the composition was where the 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 tension is is sort of um, is, is it has a, a different tone to it. Um, it's basically an image of uh, um, what what could be um, a Portuguese um, settlers getting ready to 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 leave, basically be, leave Angola, and they're they're sitting waiting. They've got uh, crates of you know um, their belongings around them. They've got bundles and bags, and and there's even livestock. And you can just tell that they're just all waiting to probably get on boats and 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 head back to Portugal. But um, what what's interesting about the use of space in that image is that um, there are moments when you're not sure who who is who is Angolan and who is not. And then you start thinking, well, what does that even mean when you've been, you know, sort of uh, uh, living in Angola for, for you know, probably a, a two generations. And um, how, does, how does that even out um, the ownership of space? Um, or how does that sort of um, reintroduce the question of, of um, who's, who really does belong? you know, to, to these spaces, who has ownership over these spaces. Um, and some of the, in some of the uh, um, positions of um, uh, uh, figures within the image, you don't actually know, it's hard to tell. It's hard to tell exactly whether, whether they're um, uh, sort of port Portuguese col you know, colonizers or if they're um, folks that have actually who are Angolan, but who have become so close with with families um, in over time that maybe you know that that uh, uh, that that sort of tension of um, ownership and divide has become a little bit smaller. In any case, it's really it's really ambiguous, and uh, I think that's a, a real strength of his of his composition and way of of bringing stories these stories to life is that you don't have there is nothing that is fixed there's you there's nothing that is completely you're completely sure of and uh, in that way um uh you're always left questioning um you know what's actually going on I, I, and so maybe maybe that's i don't know just to contribute a little bit of a, a, just a revelation just from hearing hearing you speak about those things We have another question from. Um, we have another question here from Nathan, and it says a short follow up question or of clarification for Reed. When discussing the Vancouver riots as an occupation in your conversation with Stan, was this the gas town or the Stanley Cup riots? Thanks. Reed? Stanley, the Stanley Cup riot. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think this is a, a good place to wrap it up. Uh, thank you, Karen. Thank you, Lee. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, thank you, Shadio. And thank you, Morati, for an incredible presentation. Uh, congratulations on all uh, your shows. And uh, yeah, uh, just folks, a reminder that we have another um, 
event with the Polygon. I'm gonna put in the chat all the details about it. Um, is uh, panel one, history does not repeat itself. It's a panel exploring black migration sound and place and it's happening on October 23rd. Um, a reminder that our gallery at Griffin Art Projects has an exhibition stand Douglas, Allegories of the Present. We are open Friday through Sunday, noon to 5 p.m. You can find out more about Griffin by subscribing to our newsletter at the bottom of our website. I know Shadio has uh, some last minute comments about uh, the Polygon's uh, programming as well. So Shadio, there you go. Yes, um, since Black is here on the 9th of October at the Polygon, the Polygon is hosting a listening party event in collaboration with the Black Arts Center and Made by We. And this event draws on Stan Douglas's use of grime and maraganat by inviting DJs, Hafiz Akin Lucy and Vanessa Fajemisi from Made by We to create and perform mixes on the themes investigating Canadian Blackness and music is the weapon. And there will also be a performance by Vancouver rapper Sad Boy Denzel. So I'm going to put more details and put this link in, in the chat. Well, Moriti, do you have a few things to say as well? Um, yeah, so um, this program, thank you so much to the Polygon team for inviting us to um, do this at the Polygon. But yes, the program is going to um, speak a lot to the themes present in um, the current Stan Douglas exhibition at the Polygon. But specifically, um, I would be writing an article, a short essay um, about um, the culture of resistance as well as um, community that was bred in um, um, Black DJ and um, club scenes, as well as how um, music is the weapon for a lot of Black um, people um, in the diaspora and across the diaspora. So um, yeah, thank you so much to the Polygon again for inviting us to do this. And thank you all for um, listening to my presentation earlier. Thank you everyone once again. I hope you have a nice day and we'll see you soon.